Greetings, everyone. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, our virtual presence on the net, celebrating the authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums. As is customary before each event, I'd like to let you know we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatisha Loni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We'd like to take this moment to acknowledge those who have come before us as stewards of the land and offer our respect. So tonight, we are honored to have back with us, once again, one of our country's most important thinkers, Judith Butler, celebrating the publication of their new work, What World Is This? A Pandemic Phenomenology, published by Columbia University Press. Now, in this new exploration, Professor Butler examines how the pandemic has compelled us to ask some fundamental questions about our place in the world and how we relate to one another. The book examines how the political, social, economic, and ecological consequences of COVID-19 have challenged us to reconsider the boundaries of body and selfhood. Judith Butler is dis distinguished professor in the Graduate School at the University of California, Berkeley. They are the author of several books, most recently, The Force of Nonviolence and Ethico-Political Bind. Professor Butler's previous books include Parting Ways, Jewishness and the Critique of Zionism, Antigone's Claim, Kinship Between Life and Death, amongst many others. Professor Butler is one of our country's foremost thinkers, having made major contributions in the area of gender theory and political philosophy, ethics, and the fields of third wave feminism, queer theory, and literary theory. They will be joined tonight in conversation by Gail Salomon. Gail Salomon is professor of English and the program in gender and sexuality studies at Princeton University. Her research interests include phenomenology, feminist philosophy, queer and transgender theory, contemporary continental philosophy, and disability studies. She is the author of Assuming a Body, Transgender and Rhetorics of Materiality from Columbia University Press, which was the winner of the Lambda Literary Award in LGBT studies. Her most recent book, The Life and Death of Letitia King, A Critical Phenomenology of Transphobia, was released by New York University Press in 2018. So before we begin, I'd like to let you know we're going to be posting links with which you may purchase books by both our authors in the chat of your Zoom dashboard. Uh, also, we're going to be hosting a Q&A towards the end of the evening, so please do post your questions and comments in that same chat function. Please join us now in offering a warm welcome to Judith Butler and Gail Salomon. Welcome to City Lights. It's such an honor to have you both here. Thank you very much. It's, um, for me, a, a great honor to be in conversation with Gail Salomon, but also um, to be hosted tonight by City Lights one of the truly great uh, books bookstores in the Bay Area that has persisted uh, through time and difficulty and um, just a magnificent place. And just so pleased to, to be here with you this evening. Um, uh, I uh, also want, wanted just to preface um, this event by um, saying how, how amazing and wonderful it is that um, the graduate student strike at the University of California system is happening. It is the largest strike in the history of higher education in the United States. And we are, we are watching that and we are part of that history. Uh, magnificent, magnificent event. More, let, let them win, let us win. Um, a livable wage uh, has everything to do with what we're talking about this evening, which is of course, livability and what the conditions of livability are. Um, and these brave uh, workers, students, faculty are, uh, are letting it be known uh, what the conditions of livability must be. So shout out, shout out, it's fabulous. It seems particularly auspicious to, to uh, be talking about uh, this now when, uh, yeah, at a moment of historic expression of interconnectedness and solidarity. So yes, yes. Um, I'm so excited to be talking with you about this book, Judith. Um, you you speak so eloquently in this book about the ways that the pandemic uh, has exposed um, our interconnectedness with others. Um, and also has exposed the sort of differentially distributed vulnerabilities 
uh, and conditions of equality that we live in. Uh, there's a moment on page six and you write, I just wanna read these few sentences. It is as if the pandemic keeps insisting on the pan, drawing attention to the world and the world keeps dividing into unequally exposed zones. So even though we tend to speak of the world as a singular horizon or even expect that the word world will set the horizon to experience itself, we also talk about worlds in the plural to highlight discontinuity, barriers and inequalities. And we feel it is imperative to do so to describe the world as it is. So I wonder if you could just um, uh, start by saying a little bit about, about how you're understanding the world in this book and how you're encouraging us to think about it. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, well, maybe let me start uh, by taking a step back. Like, why, why is the notion of world in the title? Why is the notion of world in the introduction? What's, what's the big deal about the world? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I was a graduate student, I think, um, uh, taking a course in literary criticism, and there was a, a reference somewhere to Ma Max Scheler's uh, essay on the phenomenon of the tragic. And it took me about five days in the library. Those, those were the days where you sat in a basement and went through many different books looking for what you were looking for until I found this particular essay. And what struck me about the essay is um, he was talking about tragedy and the sense of the tragic, not as a, as a quality that belongs to a character or as a feature of a sequence of action. Um, he was saying that, um, that sometimes there are events in the world uh, which make us wonder uh, or ask, uh, what world is this? Um, such that this event can take place. Um, and although we might be feeling like, oh, this event is absolutely monstrous, the event to which I'm responding, um, and seek to indict that event. In fact, uh, we're tempted to indict the world in which such an event is possible. <laughs> and um, I think uh, for many of us, um, I guess I would also say in the global north, um, in urban centers, in um, places where healthcare is more or less available, um, the shock of it was a shock that we uh, were subject to a pandemic. Uh, it seemed like there were epidemics and they were generally elsewhere or in the past. But for the global north, at least, there was a disorientation of time. And I think even throughout the world, regardless of what the history of epidemics might be, there was a, a rather huge disorientation since a virus that could start in one part of the world could travel very easily to another. And um, wherever the virus was, it could be uh, somewhere else in just a matter of time. Um, so we were maybe negatively interconnected, <laughs> like, oh, you know, something's happening in South Africa, that means it's going to Europe, that means it's coming here. Or as if we we know the travel routes or we we understood that um, there was a, an in interconnectedness among parts of the world that uh, we don't always feel. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, uh, 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 activists who are fighting climate destruction are trying to underscore time and again uh, how interconnected we all are. We, it's ridiculous to talk about climate destruction in one part of the world. If the climate is destroyed in one part of the world, it is, it is also uh, uh, damaging and potentially destroying the climate in, in other parts of the world, if not all parts of the world. So, um, you know, I think there was a, a sense like, oh, there's an interconnectedness here that we haven't grasped before, but also, oh, there's a radical inequality taking place. Some people are able to shelter in place because they have a shelter or uh, they, um, they don't have to go to work or they can work from home or they have access to technology or have jobs that require it. There, there were you know, radical inequalities. And we saw in the early days of, of the pandemic how um, 
uh, so-called essential workers um, who were supplying food and also um, basic goods for people um, were at much higher risk and they tended to be working class people and they tended also in the United States to be predominantly black and brown. So, um, you know, we saw quickly like how the number of dead emerged, like the morbidity rates were, uh, were, um, were radically um, different for white people and non-white people in the US. And uh, we also became alert, at least some of us did, to places in the US where affordable and decent health healthcare was completely inaccessible. So as much as we were interconnected and we might even feel a slight utopianism about that, we were also being divided up into um, different kinds of parts with relative sets of privileges and possibilities of living on. Uh, and, um, and I'm thinking also, of course, about hospital workers who were working um, without adequate protection, uh, who, who also died at, at very high rates in the, in the early phase of, um, of the pandemic. Um, so yes, I think both of those insights are there. The world is a place in which we are interconnected. The world is a place in which um, inequality, economic, racial, um, uh, hemispheric uh, uh, is intensified through conditions such as these. Yeah, so we're faced with this this inequality as you as you elucidate, and you you say at the end um, of the book, I think it's in the postscript, um, when addressing that inequality, you you say that uh, grievability is a necessary condition for equality, um, and that of course connects to um, much of your earlier work about. Um, mourning and grievability and who was able to be mourned and grieved and who was not. And I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about, about that connection, about that connection between um, um, why grievability is essential if we're thinking about equ uh, equality. Yes, um, I'm glad to do that. Um, and thank you for that question. I, uh, well, first of all, uh, let me just say that I very much doubt that any of us um, really know how to grieve all the losses that have taken place during the pandemic. Um, most of them from COVID-19, but some of them from isolation or from the inability to overcome institutional barriers to get the kind of care people needed. Uh, so many people got sick with other things and were unable to be cared for because the pandemic was overwhelming or barred the possibility of transport or overwhelmed the local hospital. So the, the deaths that have happened, um, I don't think have been grieved. I'm not sure they can be fully grieved. We could talk, what does that mean to fully grieve somebody or some set of losses? Um, I think we're still, um, to some degree, uh, um, unknowing about how to mourn mass death. Um, uh, and um, this has not been a war, uh, which is the main way in which mass death has been spoken about in recent years. Of course, we've had plagues and epidemics before um, that took many lives, so it's closer to that. But I'm not sure we know how to grieve it. At the same time, it seems like we're under an obligation to grieve those losses. And that raises the question, well, how do we grieve the loss of someone we don't know? How do we leave, grieve the loss of many people we don't know? Um, um, it's funny when I try to talk about this in, in Spanish language con context or in French language context, the words for grief are, are linked with the words for crying. And people think, oh, you want us to cry? <laughs> it's like, no, I mean, maybe, maybe you'll cry. It's possible. Uh, we've, we've cried over strangers before, right? We go to films and we cry. 
and you know we don't know those folks but um, <laughs> but um but there's something about um marking a loss acknowledging a loss <clears throat> that is part of of grief and when a life or a set of lives um disappear from the earth or um vanish uh, without being marked as such, then, um, I mean, we're left uh, feeling somewhat crazy, feeling dissociated, feeling like we know that something has happened, but there's no mark for it. There's no way to acknowledge it. There's no way to think it through um, with others. So grieving minimally involves marking that, oh, that was a life and that life was lost, or those were lives and they were lost. Um, but grieving also involves um, uh, a process with others uh, in, in which something is marked together, a, a society, a community marks a set of losses and understands itself now to have those losses as part of its history and as part of, a, a, even part of, the, part of what it carries forward um, in, a, in, a, in, in, in various traces in, the, in, in various uh, incorporated states that we might uh, have. So to so to grieve is is to mark. It's to mark with others, but it's also I think um, to be transformed by the loss, to be different from what you were before, um, to understand the world differently, to live in a different world. Uh, the world is now a different place um, uh, given those losses, and and of course. I've been worried that, uh, and I worry still that there's a kind of, oh, we're not wearing masks or we don't need to, or everything's back to normal. Or, oh, that's when, when, the, when the pandemic happened, it's all over now. But in fact, we know it continues. Um, uh, it continues uh, with hundreds of deaths every week. Um, and we, uh, and it continues in long COVID and it continues for those who are um, severely or relatively sequestered because they have no antibodies to to fight with and and no no Moderna can help them. Uh, either they're auto they're immunocompromised or they're older or uh, have another medical condition or been through chemotherapy. Um, so uh, we're we're still undergoing loss and yet we tell a story like oh that's over I don't know what their names were. Uh, we're free now. We're without the mask. We're we're happy. Uh, <laughs> we're we're liberated. And yet, um, there's a part of the population that has that continues to suffer, and and whose suffering cannot be marked when everybody else is saying everything's fine, or the pandemic is over, or we have nothing to worry about anymore. Because whoever that we is who has nothing to worry about, well, they may be kidding themselves because they might also be susceptible to long COVID or to a new variant yet to come, but they may also lose somebody close to them who turns out to be immunocompromised or um, they're not taking into account people whose lives have been very severely uh, restricted and damaged by virtue of the fact that they have long COVID and that their cognition is not what it was, that their energy is not what it was, that they're in pain um, or that they are um, uh, now living uh, with all kinds of risks that had not been anticipated before. So it worries me that we have faced this level of vulnerability and precarity in our world um, and that we manically you know, claim the end of, to the pandemic because that's a way of effacing loss, the loss that's happening as we live. But you asked me about inequality, but I, I was drawn. No, that's great. That's I was great. drawn to a different to a different problem, um, but well, it, yeah, please. Well, it just strikes me that we're 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 back to the matter of in order to describe the world, we have to talk about worlds in plural, right? The the world of people who are convinced that the pandemic is over and we're returning to normal, and there's an imperative to return to normal, and then, you know, the world where there is still a virus and that. One can feel like, okay, I'm done with masks. I'm done with this. I've decided that it's over. But one doesn't quite get to decide which of those worlds one is inhabiting, right? Like, will or inattention doesn't quite make it so. But it seems like we we sort of 
failed that um, ability to grieve either collectively, right? There, there was that one moment where somewhere in DC and it was like a, a lawn full of a bunch of tiny little American flags so that the moment of grieving was turned into this moment of like kind of mass nationalism. Yes. Yeah, it was really yeah. Something. yeah. Well, grieving can, grieving can be nation building. Uh, you know, we we saw that after 9-11 too, like, oh, here we're going to have a monument to these folks who died, but we have no monument to the people who were um, without um, documents or um, the, the, the queer people who didn't have the normative family structure that could be celebrated in the, in the various public obituaries that we found. So um, we, we sort of know how that works. We, we see how that works um, also in, 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 in war zones where the so-called enemy is not named or, or grieved um, explicitly. Uh, apparently, because it deserved to die, right? So you don't, you know, at least in modern warfare, you don't generally grieve those you think deserve to die. Although in some classical examples, you in fact did. Um, but, but I, um, you know, the it, it's true that there are different worlds, but I also feel like that separation of world is a problem, um, right? So if we say there's a world of people like saying it's all over, we're free, we're fine. Um, and freedom is a, an important category here because many people were resentful that their personal freedom was restricted. So now they're personally free. They return to their sense of individualism. They don't have to worry about other people. They don't have to be afraid of other people. At least that's how they think. Um, uh, but in fact, they do still need to worry about other people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and they're not deriving the lesson from the pandemic that they could have or should have. Um, uh, and I I think that there's a dissociative a kind of maybe collective dissociative disorder in which um, you deny your interdependency and your vulnerability to others and the ways in which others are vulnerable to you or dependent on you uh, in order to reclaim your personal freedom. Um, and that recenters individualism, it recenters anthropomorphism too, anthropocentrism. And it also um, you know, brings us back to um, this notion that our lives are, are not connected with each other. It's like, oh good, my life isn't connected with anybody else's anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the, the fantasy. That's the fantasy, that's the logic of that particular liberation of personal liberty. But you know, to embrace personal liberty of that sort, and of course I am in favor of some personal liberties, don't get me wrong, but to embrace personal liberty of that sort as the paramount value is I think to engage in a form of dissociation that literally lets people die um, uh, or doesn't really care what other people are undergoing or can't be bothered because I've reclaimed my personal liberty and nobody's gonna stop me. Uh, from exercising that liberty. And I find that on the left, I find it in the center, I find it on the right. This is not, this is not just one political party who is speaking this way. Um, I wanted to uh, ask, uh, at the end of the introduction, you, uh, you say, what, what field of study takes the world as its object? I suppose we could make a case for geography, astronomy, world literature, systems theory, environmental science. As someone trained in philosophy, I'm drawn back to phenomenology or perhaps compelled to draw it forward in order to understand the phenomenon of the pandemic as exhibiting a sense of the world or a world that is given to us in part through the senses. So I, I was really struck by your uh, your suggestion that phenomenology is the field of study that takes the world as its object. I love that, um, and and I I wondered if you'd be willing to say more about maybe either your your history with and training in phenomenology or or how you want to draw it forward in this book. So your 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 return to to phenomenology to yes. think about the pandemic. Okay. I mean, what's of course interesting, Gail, is that in my conversations with you, 
um, you've pressed me, you know, like, well, you were trained in phenomenology. What is it for you now? Do you accept it as a, as a method? Do you accept it as philosophy? Do you understand it as, as bearing truth or as having a relationship to what is true? So, you know, you pressed me in a way um, to, to think harder about it. And then you, along with some of your wonderful colleagues, uh, produced a, a giant book on critical phenomenology, um, focusing on 50 key concepts um, uh, of critical phenomenology. And I saw mainly feminists and queer people and uh, people who are combating racism and various oppressions in the world kind of taking up phenomenology and asking, you know, what, what potentials it has for um, the description of processes of subjection, of oppression, of emancipation, of critique. So all of these terms that um, had belonged uh, in my youth to critical theory were also now part of phenomenology. And I thought, well, this is an interesting encounter. Um, uh, I think when I was young, um, and I was trained in phenomenology. My dissertation advisor was a, phen a phenomenologist, uh, Maurice Natanson. And I took as many courses as I could with him, although I ended up um, uh, working on Hegel um, uh, for the dissertation itself. Um, and that's a different kind of phenomenology than, than the one we're talking about. Um, but uh, I at least in, in those days, which 1980s and maybe even 90s, um, uh, phenomenology is understood to be a science of description. It's like, oh, you know, phenomenology, all it can do is describe things, it can't change things. Um, it describes things, it, does, it can't go deep into things to find causes, um, uh, can't give a, a genealogy, it can't give a social history, it can't give a, all of that, right? It was just, oh, it was just description. And I thought, well, that's not really right. I knew it wasn't right <laughs> because descriptive phenomenology is one school among several, right? And mm -hmm. was always at war with transcendental phenomenology. Um, but also it seemed to me that there were ways that oppressive systems operate in everyday life that go largely unnoticed um, by macro theories that are concerned with social structures without asking how they're lived or how they're reproduced at the level of the everyday. So um, it seemed to me that what critical phenom phenomenology was saying is if you want to understand how oppressive systems are being reproduced, what, it, what the mechanisms are, what the steps are, you actually need to pay attention to how those phenomena are lived, enacted, supported, ratified, um, and also interrupted, uh, contested at the level of the everyday. And that could be everyday language, or it could be everyday practice or gesture, or um, you know, it, it could be the, the everyday life inside the prison. Um, and it, see, it seemed to me um, that we've, we've come to a different time in reflection on these issues where something called critical phenomenology is hardly a contradiction, but in fact, the way forward, um, uh, or at least one very important way forward. Um, in lit, in literature classes, sometimes people say, um, oh, that's just, a, that's a, a phenomenological, that's a phenomenological remark, meaning it's a remark that's based in experience. And we're supposed to know what experience is. We don't ask about what experience is or how it's constituted. We just say, oh, that's an, a report on experience or a statement that comes out of experience. But in fact, it's that moment <laughs> of trying to think about experience in its structure, its history, its sedimented history, what it um, that the kinds of temporalities that run through it, what it recalls, what it anticipates, that in fact, uh, you start to see that experience is hardly a given thing. 
it's not just my that's my experience I'm speaking from my experience that's my experience right you can't you can't just stop there that's the point of departure for uh an understanding of what is going into that experience and that's that's where a patient elaboration takes place and that's a phenomenological description is the patient elaboration of 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 how the structures of experience are constituted and even deconstituted right so that's that involves several temporalities at once and also forms of imaginary va variation thinking about you know what to what field of possibility does this experience belong um in any case um i did feel like the world was different and the world is in fact the topic of some of the very first um publications in phenomenology um if we we look at the um the journal of phenomenological research like some of the very first things was like how do we think about the world um and big debates like does the world impress itself upon us and is our consciousness a consciousness of this overwhelming world or are we constituting the world like with a very large subjectivity like oh it's actually me who's constituting the world right making the ego and the and selfhood even more central and and i thought well this is a moment where the world really has the upper hand <laughs> the world is impre impressing itself and we have to develop new structures or allow it to illuminate something about the structure of our lives. And for me, the key, the key concepts, the key dimensions of our lives that have been illuminated or maybe reinforced, right? interdependency, porosity, the mm -hmm. fact that we live in close proximity to people we don't always choose to live next to, um, unwilled proximity. So uh, interdependency, breathing each other's air, uh touching each other's surfaces uh sharing the the surfaces of the world re requiring um taking uh something foreign in in order to live to survive uh um the the foreign is the the condition of existence not the threat against it and that led me both to read in immunology but also to go back to merleau ponty um to think about well, how could we get rid of our wretched egoism and our wretched individualism by reclaiming some of these structures of interdependency? Of course, the pandemic makes them frightening, like, oh, no, we're breathing each other's air. It's like there are moments of passionate sexuality where it's like, yes, we are breathing each other's air, and that is good, right? And the fact is, is that it's part of our everyday life. We're 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 engaged in that when we're talking closely or intensely with people, or when we're singing together, right? We're we're like really exchanging air all the time, um, or even when we agree to take an elevator. Uh, but uh, you know, to think of ourselves as porous rather than bounded and defensive, to think of ourselves as interdependent or even intertwined, as Merleau Ponty would say is I think to at least begin to understand something of the texture of our sociality and giving us um, a way to understand ourselves as social creatures whose life, who, whose life and whose death um, depends on how we organize our sociality and indeed our economics and our politics. Yes, and that, and in talking about, um all those ways that we are entwined you know in the world in just very material ways you uh you also describe sort of what what we've what we lose when we are in isolation like part of part of describing what that loss is um yeah it's really striking to me too that when when we talk about when we think in an individuated way and talk about either my experience or your experience that that there's a way i mean of course that's true we have experiences that are different from one another and we each have our own in some way but one of the things that i think is so useful about phenomenology is that that's not where that's not where things stop i mean 
yes, you have an experience and I have an experience, and yet here we are in a shared world, right? So that the, the, the work of, the, the presumption is here we are in a world that's shared rather than um, in our sort of atomistic monadic uh, world. So insisting on, uh, on the fact that our world uh, is shared, so it seems like one thing that phenomenology is, is able, to, able to do well. Um, you do take up Merleau-Ponty here, and and it it seems to me, at least in part, because this philosophy is so so tactile and so haptic, uh, and you have a lot to say about touch um, in this book, or or touch as a way of thinking about our relation to others um, and the world. Um, it also occurs to me that uh, that it seems to me that this book forms a pair with your book from 2018, Notes Toward a Performative Theory of Assembly, where you're talking about um, um, how we gather, how we uh, how we protest when we're protesting, the ways that um, bodies are always acting in concert. Is it? Uh, is it fair to, to think of those books in conversation in that way? Um, yes, I'm sure it is. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to be a little more economical with my remarks. Sorry, I've been going on and on. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I do want to take questions and hear what people have to say. Um, you know, when we say the world is shared, we think, oh, sharing. Sharing is good. Sharing is what you learn in kindergarten. You know, it's like share your toys, share your thoughts. Like it's supposed to be peaceful. It's supposed to be easy. Um, but in fact, part of what it means to share the world is to come up against fairly conflictual and antagonistic situations all the time. Um, you know, Lauren Berlant in her posthumous book, um, the inconvenience of other people, <laughs> um, you know, describes that the, the kind of fundamental obduracy, right? That kind of like, diff, you know, what is this person? What do they want? You know, I'm sharing a world with them, but I can't really share well. Or part of what it is to share the world is to come up against this obduracy, to, to find some stray uh, fury coming my way, or somebody just saying no, or uh, somebody misunderstanding every word I say or refusing to listen to me uh, or not counting uh, in this shared world, not counting, um, which is something that Jacques uh, Rancière talks about at length. Um, uh, on the one hand, we're supposed to be part of a shared world, but we are the part that is no part or at least a number of people uh, fall into that uh, category of the the no part, the no part. And um, so uh, sharing can be wretched. That's all I'm saying. Sharing can be really rough and really terrible, um, but we don't have a choice about it. We have to cohabit the earth together. And that is um, something that I take from Hannah Arendt. And it's something that I, I think is a fundamental ethical precept. It's even an ethical precept against genocide and against the death penalty. Um, we, we don't have a choice. Um, I mean, we can we choose sometimes with whom we live in a house, although under conditions of student debt, you don't even get to choose that. Um, but let's say ideally you get to choose who you're close to. But in fact, you know, you don't always um, because, you know, your your relative brings their person into your life. And oh, my God, we have to have dinner with that person. <laughs> but um, but still. Uh, uh, we don't get to choose with whom we cohabit the earth. That is a basic precept. And I accept that as a kind of ethical norm. Um, I don't care like how much we may hate this group or another or wish this group was not around if we do uh, nurse feelings of that kind. We're under an obligation not just to live with them, but to develop social, economic, and political structures that support all of our lives which also means, by the way, accepting the grievability of all lives. These would be lives that would be marked and lost if they, marked and acknowledged if they were lost. 
Mm. So grievability, radical grievability is a thesis of um, the universality of the, of the value of life um, and, the, um, and, the, and the fundamental right to have conditions of life that make life livable. Th at least that's the framework with, within which I've been working for some time. Um, and of course, you know, something comes out when we do mobilize together, when we gather on the street or when we gather in ways that also care for one another. So, you know, under the pandemic, there were networks of care and um, forms of solidarity um, that uh, were sometimes local and sometimes global um, that de-domesticated uh, acts of care. So care was not just in the family. Care was not just something that um, uh, that people who are, who are women do or who are mothers. Um, uh, they don't belong to those social categories uh, exclusively. Um, and I, I really appreciated some of the radical manifestos, the care manifesto and Dean Spade's work, which have drawn attention to the forms of solidarity that could be and were, in fact, and have been and still are uh, happening, um, were created and are still happening uh, in relationship to, um, to the pandemic. But I think also in relationship to climate change, because we're all threatened with destruction and our, our lives and worlds and, and the earth itself is threatened with destruction. That's a, that's a pan situation. That's a, that's a world earth planet situation. Um, and, uh, and, and, and gathering and insisting on the conditions of livability, not just for humans, but for all creatures and even life forms is, um, is one way in which we mobilize this, this sense of our interdependency, this sense of our um, uh, uh, being responsible for uh, the persistence of not just our own life, but all lives. Um, and I think that, uh, that that's actually um, qu quite important. I mean, when we, even when we gather in demonstrations as we did for Black Lives Matter, um, we weren't just claiming, we were mourning uh, the, the completely unjust loss of life, mainly by police violence um, uh, that has um, aff afflicted the black community. Uh, but we are also calling for justice, right? So we're mourning and calling for justice. Some of the young women in the streets of Iran are mourning and calling for justice, right? The death of that young woman and the death of several other people in Iran is unacceptable. So there's acknowledging, there's mourning, there's gathering, there's being changed by it, there's calling for justice. And that relationship between grief and rage is a really crucial one for, um, for our world now. Um, because part of what we gather for is not is not to have to be mourning all the time, not to have to mourn again in that way, right? Um, so um, yeah, I suppose that's my way of answering that question and maybe even going back to the question of the relationship between equality and, and grievability. Yeah, um, that seems important too, that mourning, uh, mourning and agitation are impossible. Mourning and fighting are possible. Yes. I mean, some people I'm say, like, yeah, some people, you know, when there's a, there, there's like police violence and somebody dies, people say, don't mourn, act. And they imagine that mourning is passivity or that mourning is a pre-political or apolitical activity, but, but public mourning in Palestine, public mourning um, uh, for George Floyd, Public mourning in Iran, as we speak. I mean, these are these are powerful acts. Um, this life will not be; um, these lives will not be simply uh, uh, vanished from the earth without objection, without a mark, without an acknowledgement, without letting people know who these people are and what they were doing, what they were not doing, and um, and so. You know, there's a reckoning with justice that happens in the relationship between 
uh, mourning uh, and rage and, and collective action. I think we need all of those uh, dimensions um, uh, to, to build the world that we want to live in. Because, because mm, those forms of demonstration and especially longer forms that involve encampments or that you know, have improvisational encampments as part of what they're up to, as we saw in Tahrir Square, for instance, you know, there are acts of care, there, there are ways of living with each other and for each other that are being built. These are alternative socialities that are being built in the act of demonstration and the prolonged act of demonstration. So we're actually starting to build the world we want to live in at that time. Um, uh, and, and that strikes me as, 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 as crucial. And I, I think some people have uh, dealt with the pandemic by actually understanding how crucial a living wage is, which is why we have the largest strike in the history of higher education happening right now. So like, you know, people refusing debts um, that keep them in poverty and subjected to banks and states. Um, uh, the question of the livable condition of life has become front and center uh, in many political um, movements of our time and it's it's right that it is we um i see that we have a couple questions in um the chat do you uh feel like taking a few of those sure sure great so it so if you're um those of you listening if you have a question you can drop it in the chat um for judith and perhaps they um, can answer it. I'm, I'm just going to start with one here. Uh, and the question says, Dr. Butler, at the beginning, you spoke about connectedness and our desire to see the world as one. I've often found comfort in your work for your ability to deconstruct identity and find connectedness through differences and shared experiences. Yet I've encountered critiques of your work that argue your deconstruction eliminates connectedness. I disagree with these critiques, but I see parallels in the public discourse surrounding the pandemic and an unwillingness to recognize the ways the pandemic has affected people differently based on their race, gender, sexuality, class, and geographic location. Why do you think people are so quick to diminish these discussions? And is it really an effort to unify as one or is it something else? Um, well, um, perhaps, uh, I, I don't know why, um, it seems like after gender trouble, my work became increasingly relational and, and I, I think, um, you know, gender trouble is now almost, uh, 33 or four years old. I guess I wrote it 34 years years ago, I don't know when it arrived, maybe 32. But um, so I think gender trouble didn't do a good enough job in talking about gender, for instance, as a relational concept, but I'm certainly won over by those arguments now. At the same time, I think relationality is a fraught um, and very often ambivalent uh, uh, issue, which is why psychoanalysis remains important to me, but also a kind of clarity about uh, how difficult it is to be in solidarity, how difficult it is to share the world. <laughs> um, so, um, so I think uh, that mm, the fact of climate change, the fact of the pandemic, and these are facts, people deny them, um, but they are dissociating uh, from the, 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 the fact of things. This is the state of things. And the fact that it affects all of us actually or potentially, even if unevenly, means that we are connected, maybe not the way we want it to be, but we're connected by threats to life as we know it. Um, and that puts a new kind of um, demand on us to rethink uh, um, um, what we might call a shared world. 
And the shared world is, of course, not just a human world. Um, uh, it's it's also the earth, the soil, the air, right? I mean, we're worried about, oh, can I breathe the air or will I get COVID? Um, can I breathe the air because it's uh, polluted? But um, the other way of seeing that is, uh, um, is how is the air doing? <laughs> how is the soil doing? Uh, how, how is the earth doing? And if we don't ask that question, the possibility of a future um, uh, is, is imperiled. Um, so um, the, the life forms we care about are not just the human ones and our interconnectedness is actually crucial to our survival at this point. Um, I mean, I think that interconnectedness has been there all along and I've become increasingly convinced of that way of thinking. Um, uh, but I think uh, at this point, moving beyond national boundaries and territories to understand that interconnectedness and developing activism, mobilization, policy, even forms of governance that reflect that couldn't be more important. Um, at the same time, that can't be a utopian idea in the sense that it takes leave of radical inequalities because uh, any form of global unity that intensifies uh, social and economic racial inequality uh, will, will turn out not to be a unity at all. It will turn out to be a field of division and, and, and an intensification of, of, of precarity for some. So we have to also put it in the context of capitalism, which seizes on these efforts to, um, uh, to intensify wealth disparities and that and from wealth disparity will never emerge a unified world or a shared world that we'll be able to affirm. We have, uh, let's see, two somewhat related questions that I'll maybe pose at the same time, one from Holly and one from Adolf. The first is, how do you think the pandemic has changed our sense of self? And the next uh, is, do you feel like we know what we experienced with the pandemic, really know what we are experiencing as a society in terms of this radical inequality? Um, <clears throat> well, I do think that, um, you know, maybe we can't speak easily as a we, you know, I've been invoking a we as if there's a interconnected we, I'm not really sure there's an interconnected we, I think there should be, you know, so my invocation of the we is aspirational. <laughs> it's an effort to gather us, it's like, uh, come with me. It's like, we come with me. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's not, it's not representing an existing, group that would agree with me necessarily uh, or would agree to be included in the we. Um, a lot of people are very involved with the I or with their local we, their nationalism or their um, uh, their their communitarianism. Um, um, I, I think um, that um, when we um, talk about so I'm not sure about one world. Um, I think an inner a, a world that is defined by interconnectedness allows for differentiation, um, specificity, even singularity, to use Adriana Cabrera's term, um, without uh, uh, losing relationality. And so we're not all the same. Uh, we're this is not an argument about human nature. Oh, we all have the same human nature and I can tell you what it is. And that's what unifies us as a human world. That's not my point. But my point is that um, across languages, across barriers, across various divisions and uh, differentiations, there are forms of relationality that emerge when we find ourselves in a common predicament or when our very lives are at stake. And we see that only through a politics of interdependency that acknowledges our porosity, do we have any um, hope of um, surviving as earth and world? Um, 
I guess I would also say uh, that um, I think it is a chance to rethink the body, not as a defended entity. Um, this is this is my enclosed uh, uh, corporeal being. Of course, we are enclosed in certain ways. Let's hope our organs are, for the most part, uh, enclosed. We don't want maybe all of our organs to be enclosed fully, but maybe most of them should. Um, but we are also porous. So we're also constantly opening toward the world. And if we were not opening toward the world, we would not survive, right? We need to, to breathe. We need to inhale and exhale. We need to um, ingest, digest. Um, we need to, um, we, we, we need that opening towards the world. And one of the things the pandemic did was make us fearful of this very opening that we need to survive, right? It's like, oh, the very, the very aspect of embodied existence that opens towards others into the air and the surfaces and the world, which should be joy, which should be survival and passion and joy, or even making and labor um, or coexistence in some um, uh, regenerative way. Uh, that very opening is precisely the, the source of peril. So how what happens when the, that which you depend on to survive becomes that which imperils you most? And that was the bind. And I think people were and are wretched and that they don't fully know uh, how to live. I think we generally, at least in the world that I live in, people don't, don't embrace each other in the way they used to. There are these kind of awkward, hesitant embraces. And maybe, maybe that's good for minimizing sexual harassment and unwanted you know, intimacy, uh, but it's also a less spontaneous and joyful way of, of interacting. Um, and and I think it's hard when dancing and and being sexual become uh, the place where you feel like you're risking your health or the health of somebody else um, should be life affirming. And yet there is this 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 specter of the precarity of life that haunts our intimacies, uh, and that is still with us. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, I'm quite clear. Uh, we are, for the most part, dissociating from the losses that have happened and that are still happening in order to live. Uh, but that, that form of living is afflicted by what it cannot acknowledge. Um, so it's a form of, of melancholia, very possibly a global form. Yeah, you, you, there's a moment in the book where you talk about the, the ways all of that loss, all those particular kinds of losses sort of drag us down. Uh, and you, you call it a, a kind of perpetual sorrow that afflicts all the joints of sociality. It's kind of rheumatoid sorrow <laughs> the pandemic has, has unleashed. There's an interesting question. Oh, there's a, oh, there's a, oh, okay. There's a bunch of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, how about this one, which seems related from Jerry, dear Dr. Butler, if indeed there is a performative movement between society and the individual subject, now that COVID isolation has largely restricted togetherness through Zoom or other video mediated communication, how does this change the notion of subject formation in the absence or diminishing of other affectual capacities, touch, smell, et cetera? So I take it to be sort of asking uh, where you left off uh, with the last question and just thinking about, so what, what can we say about how we can be together now? Um, uh, well, um, <clears throat> obviously things have for many people shifted, not for all people, but for many people shifted so that, that there is more capacity to be together and to and to not be only fearful of proximity. Uh, although I think a bit of fear 
is there, maybe suppressed, maybe uh, experienced in a peripheral way, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I think um, that we are, um, I, even when we're at a distance from other people, we're still socially constituted. Um, that distance is a social distance, right? It's called social distancing, which is a really odd, uh, was a really odd phrase. Um, uh, the distance connects us. It's not just what separates us. We're, and indeed, at the point where we were, or many of us were distancing, we were involved in a common kind of action, even though we were doing it at a distance from one another. Um, I do uh, worry as many people have, and I know there are um, educational psychologists who've been writing about this, um, about young children whose in, encounter with strangers uh, as a two or three-year-old, it was, it, was, it was an experience of fear, or they were told, don't play closely with so-and-so. They're, you know, frightened of, um, of, of, uh, um, of, of in, in, intimate play uh, with, with their, with their peers. And that, I don't know what effects psychosocial that has or will have uh, in the long run. I think also the experience of isolation has been devastating, certainly for some of my students, but for many people and for many young people, um, uh, the screen, the screen is social. I mean, the screen is even if if it's the sign of a social distance, it's still a way of connecting. So the media becomes part of sociality, and even being um, formed in and through media engagements is a form of social constitution. So I don't think the individual is separated from society. I think those forms of separation are social forms. Okay, we have a related question. Uh, esteemed Dr. Butler. Your writings on gender performance, identity, and the heteronormative contract helped to shape a generation of people. What advice would you give to my current gender studies students who are proudly intersectional third wave LGBTQIA plus global revolutionaries coming of age during the era, era of social media and the COVID-19 pandemic? These two generational markers are intertwined with the current gender revolution you helped to shape. But I would love to know how you perceive those connections to be shaping the current feminist movement and how young people can move forward collectively from here. Hmm. Well, you know, for me as a theorist, and this was also true <laughs> 34 years ago or whatever it was, um, I, I actually work the other way around. I don't say to the young or to anyone really, this is what you must do, and this is the future, and follow this path. I'm not, um, I'm not a public intellectual of that kind, and I'm not a leader of that kind. What I do is I, I actually try to um, sense what is happening in social movements, and then translate that into a theoretical understanding that hopefully reflects back in some way what people are already doing and allows them to imagine new possibilities for themselves. But I'm, 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 I'm something of a mediator in that way. Um, I mean, I certainly learn from the new work in gender studies and in critical race studies and um, intersectional analysis and global, the feminism of the global South, which I've been reading a lot of. Um, I'm learning all the time. Uh, I'm I'm especially moved by the um, capacity of uh, Latin American feminisms, especially Ni Una Menos, to you know bring millions of people out in the street. Um, and we have a lot to learn from their reproductive justice um, work. I also think reproductive justice has been framed within Black feminism in ways that have not fully translated into democratic, liberal, uh, legal, and political agendas, um, focusing on, on, the, on the justice part 
not just the individual right of the person, but the justice of reproductive justice, like who has access, whose, whose lives are, are left to, to flounder or to um, uh, suffer um, by virtue of uh, inaccessible and or damaging healthcare, you know, explicitly damaging healthcare. So I, I, I think um, we all need to read widely and let ourselves be surprised. And at this point, um, I think it would be arrogant and not very useful for me to say what I think ought to happen. But I am moved by um, those forms of feminism that connect, say, uh, reproductive justice to um, uh, equal wages, to um, the opposition to uh, sexual violence and harassment um, uh, that um, also uh, understand that feminism can't exist without uh, the opposition to racism, that feminism can't exist without the opposition to transphobia, that feminism is intimately bound up with disability movements, um, that these interlinkages is where feminism lives. It's not it's not this thing over here that then decides its relationship to all these other things. It's what runs through them. It's one thing that runs through them. And it should embrace that tra tra transversal character rather than um, become uh, an autonomous uh, uh, movement that has to um, rival other movements or distinguish itself from them. I think that's a mistake. Uh, Similarly, I think being part of anti-capitalism is crucial for the hist for the future of the world and for the future of equality and being part of thinking about ecological devastation. So many eco-feminists have done excellent work on that. But as you see, feminism is existing in all these relationships. It's not just one thing. I mean, it breaks my heart, the 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 minority of feminists who um, have decided that transphobia is a legitimate form of hatred to defend in public. I don't understand why feminism would be a project of hatred, why feminism could ever be uh, a project of discrimination. That just doesn't make sense to me. Um, <clears throat> I presume that they are operating with ignorance or besieged by phantasms of fear that haven't been worked out, but um, that form of divisiveness doesn't, doesn't bode well for the future of our world. Um, maybe, maybe a few more. So, uh, you referred to Hannah Arendt and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Could, could you discuss how their ideas impacted your own critical phenomenological theories? Um, well, as I said, uh, I mean, Hannah Arendt, I would argue with on many issues. I think she was abysmal on race. I don't actually accept her way of distinguishing world and earth. Um, I think she's um, problematically anthropocentric. Um, I think she's not a feminist. Uh, at the same time, uh, she gives us some vocabularies for thinking about acting in concert um, and cohabiting the world together. And um, I, I think she developed her idea of what it is to cohabit the world in part uh, through her quite um, uh, searing attack on, on Eichmann and on um, the, the Nazi genocide more broadly. The, the mistake that the Nazis made and that Eichmann made was to think that they could choose with whom to cohabit the earth. And that is not their choice. Um, and I appreciated that. She set the limit to freedom exactly there. Um, I, and I think it helps us, like, how do we act together? How do we act in concert? And for her, freedom is not just personal freedom. It's something that happens between us when we act together. Um, when we when we undertake an endeavor together, so it actually emerges from the relation between us, from the the interval between us, uh, the what 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 is what is in between, and I I like that. It seems like that makes us both social and differentiated at the same time. Um, 
And Merleau-Ponty, I think, is even more kind of precise in thinking about what that cohabitation is. For him, it's we're not next to each other. We're intertwined. Like we are, we are, our, our, our bodies are constantly uh, um, affected by uh, uh, other bodies and we are constantly affecting other bodies. And we don't, we usually seek recourse to easy ideas of action and passivity like, oh, you acted on me. Oh, I acted on you. Well, sometimes the exchange between us may well be complicated where you're acting and I'm acting, but I'm also receiving and you're receiving and we can't really get over that ambiguity. That ambiguity is, is part of the world of touch. It's part of the world of um, being entangled or um, uh, intertwined with one another. So he even insists more, like we're, we're not discrete individuals. You know, if we think about the body as a discrete entity, which some legal systems do ask us to do, like my body's my property. One, we don't really wanna argue for reproductive rights on the basis of that notion. We don't have to. Um, um, if, if, if I'm a little territory or if I'm a, if I'm a piece of property that should be defended against anything that could possibly move me or transform me, then I have lost my social and erotic uh, existence in the world. Um, uh, and for Merleau-Ponty, you know, sexuality is coextensive with existence, which doesn't mean that we're all having sex all the time. <laughs> it means that we are moved by one another and we, our ways of affecting each other are, are create a zone of corporeality where um where we're really in each other's hands we're really we're, we we can't differentiate except through some pretty artificial ways um and we can we can get distance from people we need to get distance from don't get me wrong but we can't get distance from sociality itself we're we're going to be entwined somewhere else um uh even if we get distance from the person we don't want to be near. Um, so I think, um, you know, those are sort of two concepts that are really important to me that I think also are di dimensions of our, our corporeal world, uh, to the, the one we live together, uh, maybe the, the world we share uh, that have been illuminated by the, the pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take but two more questions, but then, then I think I'm going to call it a, an evening. Yeah, maybe, or let's see. Uh, I mean, this might be a good one to close it out. At, um, Jeff asks, at this point, what inspires you and gives you hope? Um, um, going to see art. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I don't I, I can't even give an account of why I, I'm I feel so strongly about seeing what other people have created but sometimes when it's on a canvas or it's a distinct event it it takes over my mind and it transforms my mind and I emerge anew and I'm not just left with my mind by myself and maybe that's a kind of mm, pandemic desire it's certainly become more acute I was surprised by how much I missed just going to see pictures or not just on the screen, but some other kind of encounter, either, you know, an, an exhibition of some kind. Um, not, not really sure why, but I, I felt like my mind was given over to the object and it, it, it modified my mind in a way that allowed me to reenter life in a new way. That's probably a modernist conceit. I don't really know. I feel like it's Winnicottian actually, like the object contained me and mm. changed me and then set me free. Um, but of course, I'm watching, I'm watching with great interest some of the social movements. Um, I think the, the young women in Iran are courageous and amazing. I'm very worried about how their struggle for freedom will be co-opted by people who are either cultural imperialists or, or, or Islamophobes or um, you know, want to recruit them for their own particular uh, political platform, but but it's it's a it's it's a it's a moving thing, and the songs that go with it, that that movement for freedom is a is a really moving thing. I feel like feminism continues to be 
uh, very moving to me, even though um, I'm saddened by some of these divisions that have a certain amount of hatred and fear at their core. I hope we can overcome that somehow. Um, and of course, um, I'm, I'm moved by experimental art and experimental political action. People are trying to create new social forms and new ways of being in community and new ways of providing care that don't always um, uh, reduce to the family uh, or the household, uh, but that let us live in community and even find our, our kin there. Okay. Yeah, well, perhaps that's a... That's a way to stop? Good place to leave it. All right. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much. You're my best reader. And my, Thank you, Judith. I'm just so pleased always to be in conversation. The next time I'm going to be asking the questions of you, though. Oh, okay. Deal. All right. Be, be aware. <laughs> be forewarned. Be forewarned. I look forward to it. All right. And thank you, um, City Lights. You're, you're a great place, and we love you. <laughs>